Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Loftus, and Mark Raycroft. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome to another episode of Wild and Exposed podcast. Uh, we've got everybody at home this week. Uh, Jason Loftus coming to us from Utah. Michael coming to us from Colorado, and I'm coming to you from Wyoming. We're joined tonight by Steve Kirkpatrick, who is out of, where are you at, Steve? Madison, Mississippi. Madison, Mississippi, and that is close to Jackson, Mississippi, correct? Exactly. It's uh, it's it's one of the suburbs. Okay. And how long have you been down there? I've been in Madison, Mississippi a very long time. I moved here in 79 in this area. I moved, I've moved around but in this area since 79. So I've been here, what, 41 years? That's long. Yeah. Long enough. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Steve, typically we start these off. What is your favorite ever outdoor experience? Wow. <laughs> Start me off with a brain teaser, huh? <laughs> it does not have to be photography or videography related. It can any anything that's happened to you in the outdoors. Oh but, my gosh! But it could be, you know, if it was that could, yep, could once be. in a lifetime shot or anything that was cool. I have a number of terrible things I didn't like. Um, <laughs> failed excursions, you may call them. Uh, everybody knows those, right? We'll talk uh, about some of those so much later. So. Do what? They may not know about that. I mean, that might be a good story if they're funny or you never know. Well, okay. The, this this is one that comes to mind and there's, gosh, there's a thousand. But so this happened about maybe 15 years ago. And I was working. We have obviously around Mississippi, pretty much the whole state's wild. You know, we're a rural state, so to speak. Um, lots of swamps, marshes, obviously tons of wooded areas. And I was on the edge of a marsh swamp type um, area and I had been working in the water that day. Um, many years ago, I developed um, for myself a, 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 a way of shooting water level that I called the frog's eye view. And basically, you're in the water with your camera laying right on top of the water, and the only thing sticking out of the water is your head. And I shot like that a lot. Um, started shooting that within the first two years of me getting a camera, and actually was one of the ways I started getting published because it was such a unique point of view, which is right. Everybody's always looking for something new and different, and different way of seeing it. So it ended up being a good thing. Anyway, I had finished that. I had come out of the water, I dried off. It was mid-afternoon and I decided that um, something just kind of was unctioning me to go over to this wooded area not very far from where I was, maybe less than a half a mile. So I, I drove down there. I had a blind um, that I set up, uh, a little ground blind that I could literally set up in, in one minute, just pop it on the ground and basically crawl in it. And there was a, it was an area I'd seen before and there was this nice looking log you know, this, this like photogenic log laying down on the ground. And um, often people ask, you know, what's, what's the problem with, with photos? And I said, well, sometimes, you know, the, everything is perfect except for one element. You know, you got the subject, but you don't have the background. You got the background, but you don't have the subject. You got the light, but then you don't have either one of those. And then you get to all three of them and nothing happens, you know. So I'm sitting up in front of this great looking log, a dead tree based log, and I'm kind of getting set up and I'm messing around. I'm, I've got a couple of cameras. I got one on a tripod. I'm trying to figure out what lens I need. And I'm kind of in the middle of, of getting ready. And this small covey of quail jump up on this log, which is about 15 feet in front of me. And the knife cock Bob White's up front and he's walking down the log and he's got his 
girlfriends with me walking down behind him. And there was a snag on the end of the log down here. And I'm looking at this and I can't get the camera ready because I had the the wrong lens on the camera and I needed a different lens and it was on the tripod and I'm trying to make a decision. And all this happened very, very fast. And they walked down the log and they kind of looked around and did a little chirping and stuff. And then he climbs up on that snag and starts calling. And I'm losing my mind because it's like one of those, you know, those, they always say you get 12 once in a lifetime shots in your life. If, if you're lucky, that was going to be one of those 12. And I got finally got it all together, and bloop, they were gone. But you and got the shot, or you didn't get the shot? I, oh God, no! I didn't get anything. <laughs> and I picked up my stuff immediately, put the cameras in the bag, grabbed the stupid blind, threw it in the back of the car, went and got in my car, went and parked on a little area over there, and I made it was a very very serious thing of whether I was going to quit that day or not. <laughs> gonna was, quit photography or just quit shooting for the day no quit photography forever oh my <laughs> it was that impactful of an experience and when you miss one of the things i mean you'd have to see it the light was great the the, the whole scene was great i mean it's still photography and you know i'm looking for that one of those 12 that i'm going to get in my life if i'm lucky and that was one of them and i did not get it and it just about ruined me i didn't shoot for at least a week after that because i was just so bummed out but anyway that's not a great story but it's kind of it's kind of <laughs> you know my what? Personality and what i'm after we were we were talking a little bit before the show before we were able to get you on about one of the three of us had a kind of a bad weekend <laughs> things didn't didn't come together and this doesn't happen to this one person very often. It <laughs> always comes back with these epic shots. <laughs> so we were talking, and it, it does happen once in a while, and they're the ones that sting. I yeah. think probably when you have the opportunity and you can't, you know, you're not able to get it, that's worse than just having nothing happen. Well, I think before we go on too much further, I, yeah, I love we, that. I think you guys should, each one of you should, should say a story or talk, tell a story about the one that I've got a perfect one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. The one I that will got never, away. ever, ever forget this. And I had that little meeting with myself. Just, <laughs> just like Stephen did the same meeting that Stephen had. Yeah. yeah. Jason, go ahead. I don't know what you're talking about. Every time I have the chance, I nail it. I don't <laughs> <laughs> okay, of course. I didn't, was, I didn't know this was a liar's forum. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. A bunch of guys together just chatting, right? Yeah. It's right. how do you not know? Of course I've missed them. <laughs> I don't know if I have a I don't know if I have a one right off the top of my head if somebody else wants to go. Mike, if you've got one, give yeah, me a second to kind of think about it. I I've got a lot, I'm sure, but I just need to think of one. But. All right. So we're up in Denali on a photo permit, right? Kind of mid afternoon. And, you know, there's not a lot going on mid-afternoon in the summer in Alaska. I mean, it's still a lot of light left, right? So you're waiting for hours till till sunset for the really pretty light. But my buddy spots a lynx. Like back in behind Wonder Lake in there, there's a lot of what they call kettle ponds. It's yeah. basically where a, an iceberg is melted a long time ago. Not an iceberg, but an ice chunk left behind from a, a glacier. Right. No and it well. makes these depressions, right? So there's this lynx like slinking around the edge of it and we're just watching. It's pretty far away. And then it sneaks back into the trees and we can't see it. So that gave us a chance to get out, kind of get set up with our tripods because we thought, huh, there's some ducks out there. I wonder if that lynx is going to go duck hunting. So we got set up, got everything ready to go. Had time. We had time for this whole thing, right? It, unlike you, Stephen, that I had time. I, my, I was like, I'm going to nail this thing. And sure enough, here, here he comes kind of slinking out and he goes, he takes a humongous jump and, you know, motor drives going, not motor drive, but, you know, the camera's going. It was this, I think this was digital times. So I'm just shooting away and I'm like, oh, these are awesome. I had him perfectly framed in the shot and comes out, missed the duck, 
But you know how the, he looks like. You know they look awesome when they got their fur all dry. But when he's all wet, it looks like a pathetic like alley cat that's been, you know, hasn't eaten for three months. Comes out and he's like shaking his paws. You know, one step and he'd shake a paw off, and he'd step and he'd shake a paw off, and he'd step and and got out. And then you know he was pretty disgusted with himself. You could tell that he had missed. And I'm like, oh, I got that. I just got him in midair. The duck's gonna be flying off, and and I did. I got it. But this guy forgot to set the shutter speed where it needed to be to capture a sharp picture. And I just, I missed it. It looked great on the back of the camera, but the minute you put it in a computer and looked, it on, looked at it on a monitor. So I didn't tell anybody. I showed everybody the back of the camera. I didn't fess up to that it was a blurry <laughs> shot. Everybody to this day still thinks I got the shot. Of course, it's <laughs> never been published anywhere, right? Because I missed it. You just saved it with your personal best, I yeah. yeah, but I'll, I guarantee you, I've never had that problem again. I have never forgot to set the shutter speed. Yeah, the famous saying: "You learn more from your mistakes." Well, I know a lot. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, yeah, that's funny, Mike. I've I've got one. I actually, it's it, it was with uh, it was the night I met some friends of the show. It was Gary and Mitch Bainter, the Creek Bed Photography guys. And I met them out shooting some mule deer and we just happened to come across each other and started chatting. And we walked down this little pathway and had this amazing opportunity come up where these two big mule deer bucks just came together and they just started decided they were going to fight. And it happened real fast as it often does. They didn't really posture much. They just came together and started going at it. Well, we all lifted our cameras up and started blasting away and my camera went click, click and nothing. And meanwhile, I'm hearing Gary's and Mitch's cameras going click, 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 you know, just going off. And I'm going, what in the world? I'm panicking and I'm looking, I'm watching the fight. I'm looking at my camera. What's going on? Memory card full, right? <laughs> so <laughs> I've talked about this multiple times on the show and I think I've learned my lesson. I'm not 100% sure, but usually when I'm out in the field now, I really pay attention to that memory card and how much room I have left. And if it looks like I'm in a situation where... Even if I'm 500 images away, I might, you know, swap that card out or always checking my batteries, all those kinds of call them the rookie mistakes that we that we make some, from time to time. But, yeah, that one hurt because uh, they got some amazing photos from that sequence. And uh, I was pretty jealous of them. And <laughs> it's all because I wasn't paying attention to the, some of those little details that we uh, that we should be paying attention to all the time. So you don't miss an opportunity like that. But. Anyways, they got it. So <laughs> somebody got it. Somebody got it. That's right. Uh, but you'll never it. not have a full camera in your card. I or learned a full card in your camera. I learned. <laughs> I've had so many of them that nothing sticks out really. <laughs> well, here's here's my observation on what y'all just said. Um, you're you're y'all all of y'all are a lot younger than I am. Uh, I spent all that time in all these places with 36 exposures <laughs> and film. I, I have my own philosophy about film and digital. I, I turned over to digital very late 2012. First digital camera I bought to me, nothing was good enough. Good as a film until about 2012 when they first, when they finally mastered the hi highlights and the darks, when they finally got that captured, um, where they could deal with that in raw and digital format. That's when I changed over because I realized it, it was kind of running away with from me at that point. And I have another story about why I did. But when you have to, when you work with slide film, you got a half a stop on each side of perfect before it's bad. That's not much, right? And you got 36 exposures before you got to open the back, roll it up, put it in a case, get another case out, put it back, roll it back, make sure it catches the sprockets, make sure you get to the frame one before you can even think about shooting again. <laughs> and plus you're limited to, with with most of my shooting, with 50 ASA Velvia Fuji. And you're not going much past 100. So when you, when you spend most of your career with those limitations, the, the digital thing just ruins you. Just <laughs> absolutely ruins you. You mean I can shoot a thousand pictures before you have to change anything? <laughs> I, mean, I can miss it six stops and I'm still can fix it. I, it just blows your mind when I first started doing it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, yeah. I picked up on that same thing, Stephen, when Jason said, well, if I only have 500 left and I'm thinking about, cause I started in the slide days too. And yeah. you wouldn't shoot 500 images in a day sometimes with slide film because it was, you know, it was this hot commodity and it's a very expensive. So, well, yeah, in the back of your mind, it's always how much film do I have left? How much does this cost? And blah, blah, blah. I mean, you know, yeah. I go to Alaska and depending on how long I was there, I bring 50 rolls, 100 rolls, whatever roll. But if I'm there for six weeks, I got to, this, this has to roll out for a while, you know? Right. And it is a limitation and it does affect your thinking. I mean, it really does. And before you're going to take a shot, and I like, I never took more than three shots of anything. I never pressed the shutter and let it rock and roll. Never. Not ever once. I would know I got one shot. I need the best shot of the sequence. And I'm going to predict it where it happened before I hit the shutter. I mean, it, it just one, maybe two. But that's just the way you were trained. I mean, that's just, you, know, that, you had that one shot. And before you had Power Wander, you had to click and wind and click and wind and click and wind. And you're only, you're only getting one shot every three or four seconds then. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of different now. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it just shows in when you watch it or see Instagram or you see, I mean, just the images that people can get nowadays just because of the time you save and, you know, you've got unlimited chances to, to get that shot. So it just speaks to, you know, these iPhones or phones in general take better pictures than those old, you know, film cameras where you had 50 ASA or, you know. 100 ASA film, it's got a tighter grain. You don't have the zoom that you could get, but you could do a nicer just, picture on the phone. I just did two short films with my iPhone just because people, a lot of a lot of people would, would comment. I mean, I wanted to do it because it was a personal challenge, right? Um, and plus the iPhone 11 shoots 4K and it's actually very, very good. Um, now you're limited as to what you can do with it and lenses because I, I, all I used was the phone. That is it. No attachments, no special anything. Did the voiceovers on the phone, did the natural sounds on the phone, did everything on the phone. And it's amazing the 4K clarity on an iPhone and then it, everything that's built into it now as far as uh, keeping, the, you know, it's not shaky, It's it's got its own algorithms in there to fix all kinds of things, you know. And I just wanted, people said, well, you, got, you know, you've heard it, all y'all heard well, you got the big camera, you got the big lens, you got the big this and the big that, you got blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, here's a here's a, here's a, a phone. You got one of those, so we're equal now. Let's go. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yep. So is that something that's on YouTube that we could see or that the audience could see, or is that something you yeah. did as a private project? Yeah. I did two. I, well, I did, I did the first one um, during when the pandemic first started, and it's called I, Ferona. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did the second one several months later called I Backyard. It's on Vimeo. Are they password protected or is that something that anybody can go both, watch? Both of those are not password protected. Okay. Yeah. And is it, what's your Vimeo page? Uh, Stephen Kirkpatrick. Okay. I'll put a link if that's cool with you. We'll put it in the show notes so y'all can go see what can be done with an iPhone. If some reason can't find it, I can email you or text you a link directly to it so you'd have the code okay you know? no i think that's awesome because you do get that all the time where it's somebody says that i can't do what you do but when in fact if you got a pretty current phone you can well the i backyard was all the the, the way i de the way i decided my, now i live in a neighborhood but behind my house is woods okay and the way i determined it was my backyard if i could <clears throat> if i could get to shooting something within 60 seconds that's as far as I would walk. That's my backyard. So that, because somebody said, well, your backyard, you might've walked three miles. You know, so, no, it, it was, it was been throwing a rock from my back door. So I limited to that to make sure it was fair. Right. And, um, just went about it that when I took a long time, I had one squirrel that wore my butt out, <laughs> <laughs> not do what I wanted him to do. And it's like, oh, it's a great shot of a squirrel. And I said, yeah, that squirrel shot took three and a half days, dude. You know, so you know, yeah. that's awesome. So let's back up a little bit, Stephen. We kind of dove into it with, with that story. And I, I think it's a good story for everybody to hear because everybody thinks I got a, a friend of mine that calls me uh, Dr. Doolittle because they <laughs> think you just go out there and, and the animals just perform for you. 
and that's definitely not the case. So to hear about those those times when we don't find success, I think is good for everyone. But let's back up a little bit and talk about, we know you've been in Mississippi for 41 years. How long have you been shooting and how did you get your start there? I got my first camera in 1981. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm working on a book right now called 40 Years Wandering in the Wilderness. Um, and I'm going to go back all, all the way to the fir- very first pictures I took 40 years ago. Uh, my father gave me a camera. It was a little Nikon FE with a little Vivitar 70 to 210 lens on it. And I thought I had won the lottery when I got that thing. And he gave it to me for no reason at all. It wasn't my birthday or anything. He just gave it to me, saw it somewhere or something. The whole, the whole rig cost, you know, $210 probably. Um, and that's where I started. And I started just, I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. I'd never owned a camera before. I was always an outdoor guy. Um, I was, I have a picture of me camping in Alaska at 11 months old. That was, that was 65 years ago. I'm 66. And my father was in the air force. And so he was stationed there. And so we, my first three years of my life were in Alaska. And he, he took me out camping as much as he could when I was a little bitty kid. Of course, I can't remember any of that. I remember the stories and the pictures, but that's about it. Um, and that's where I started. And so I've, I've always accredited, at least for, 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 for me and, and people like me, and I'm assuming y'all and people I know that are all kind of in this same um, kind of sick profession to some extent, uh, <laughs> the, the, the love of nature was my calling card, not the love of photography. And mm-hmm. photography was a way to see it and share it. And so I've always been more focused on the nature part of this stuff, the outdoor um, knowledge, skills, naturalist type side of it, and then figured out all the photography and technical and everything else that you had to do to be able to capture that. I never was like in the cameras. I have very little gear. I've always had very little gear. I, I never had a lot of money, so I couldn't I couldn't buy just all kind of crap that you could have the toys. I had, I had what I needed and that's it. And if I couldn't put it all on my back, I, I, I wasn't going to buy it. So I started with very little. And my philosophy in the beginning was, well, if you have a 200 millimeter lens, couldn't you get twice as close with a 400 millimeter lens. I said, well, I don't have a 400 millimeter lens. So for me to equivocate the 400 millimeter lens, I just, I I did it in reverse. I gotta be twice as close. So if I get twice as close with a 200, as you over the 400, we pretty much have the same shot except for angle of view. And so it just made me work harder with less equipment to get what I needed to get. And that's always been my philosophy is loving nature and this camera, this thing, I'm, it's a hammer and I'm building a house with it. You know, I'm, you know, I have, I have, I have, I'm jumping around all over the place, but I was teaching a workshop at, uh, about 20 years ago, I guess. And it was, um, at real foot Lake in Tennessee, which is a really neat waterfowl area. It's been a historically waterfowl area for a long, long time. A lot of famous people have hunted there and obviously ducks. And I was teaching a workshop there and we were, we were milling around trying to set up a shot. It was a sunset shot on the lake and it was real pretty that day with, with nice clouds. And this guy started poking around in my bag and he's digging around in my bag and I'm looking at him like, what is he trying to do? Steal my lenses or something? I mean, you know, and he he, put, he put, look, picks up something, he puts it back down, he picks up a camera, he puts it back down, he picks up, and I didn't have that much. And he, he says, how do you take all these wonderful photos? And I said, what do you mean? He said, everything in this bag is broken or dirty. And I said, those are tools. Those are tools to create something. The best part of that story was after that workshop was over, I drove back home. When I got home, there was a, UPS box by my front door. I opened it up. There was a brand new Nikon F4 in that box with a note from this guy that said, you keep it. You need it more than I do. Whoa. Wow. That's quite a tip. 
and he he doesn't understand how bad I needed that camera, and it came that way. And so, it's a tool, you know. So anyway, I, I, Ron, I went off on a on a I went off on a Bob White quick quail log just then. So just go. <laughs> no worries. So how long have you been shooting professionally? Pretty much the whole time. Uh, I started. I, I started pretty much figuring it out real quick. I had my first show. 14 months after I got a camera, I had my first book less than two years after I got my first camera. Um, I figured out real quick. I had the first gallery three years after I got my first camera. I figured out real quick that everybody else made money except the photographer. <laughs> and I had to find a way to publish books, to design books, to sell them retail and wholesale, to sell prints in the gallery, and I would make the profit to take on all these different roles. And so my educational part just went crazy because I had to learn. So, I mean, I was, I was doing framing, I was doing anything I could do, anything I could do to make a living. I started obviously doing the weekend shows. I didn't like doing that, but I did a few a year. Um, I started doing speaking engagements. I got invited to do a speaking, a speaking engagement in 1985. I got this call. And this person said at the time, we heard you did a speaking engagement. Would you like to come to our group? And it was a civic group. And I said, sure, yeah, I'll be there. I had never done a speaking engagement in my life. And I'd been fooling around with a couple slide projectors. This may be before your time, too. <laughs> um, with multiple slide projectors where you're doing images and it looks like a video, but you do it with multiple projectors and it's very difficult and, all, and everything always breaks. Um, and I've done over 3,000 speaking engagements. So I was doing about 125 a year at one point. And that helped me sell prints at the speaking engagements. It helped me sell books at the speaking engagements. People would see me in the speaking engagement and say, hey, I got a job. Can you come to my place and shoot X, Y, Z? And so the speaking engagements gave me, brought me business, basically. Mm -hmm. And it was the only form of advertising I had at the time. And it, it worked well. It worked very well. I didn't set out to do it for that reason, but that's how it turned out. Yeah, it's always, Mike mentions it often, that we've talked to so many people now over, this is season four that oh, wow. we're into now. And through the, the four years that we've been doing this, we've talked to so many people and not a single one of them has the same story as someone else. I think the four of us are probably more similar than anybody else I've met. We just, you know, the one commonality is everybody loves the outdoors. Right. And the, the love of nature obviously is the driving factor, but there's always a little bit different road that people have taken. And so I enjoy very much hearing, uh, hearing what or how people got to where they are currently. Well, I think your story too speaks to just what kind of hustle it takes to do this. You can't just say, oh, I'm going to be a photographer and take pictures for the Absolutely. most part. I mean, you can, if you're going to shoot for a magazine or you're going to be a staff photographer, or you're going to have a job like that. But if you want to make a living at it and do decent, you are going to have to be a framer. You're going to have to write some books. You're going to have to publish some pictures. You're going to have to do those speaking engagements. Because that's what makes the whole world go round. And I think that's just good for the audience to hear just because it's not, it's not, when you look at it, that taking the pictures is what, 25% of your time? I, I'm just I, guessing. I guess. I don't know. I yeah, mean, I don't yeah. know either. But I mean, it's definitely, you spend just as much time doing all the other stuff, you know, just as much time doing that as you do taking the pictures. But it, well, it changes. Every year it changes, too. And, you know, we all get really busy in the fall, and that tends to be the real big photo time. But then you can use this time of year. Well, we're in de late December now, and January and February are generally kind of slow. I mean, you can go find stuff, but you can get a lot of that other work done then. Yeah, it's, um, I, I've always worked year-round. I, I know because of where you're located, but I always tried to travel a lot. And Winter was one of my busiest times. Summer was one of my busiest times up north. You know, spring is a busy time. Fall is a busy time. And I also do a lot of diving and underwater photography. And so that that, that gave me a whole other avenue of, of, of shooting, you know, in a different environment, in a different place. 
and totally leaving, you know, the uh, the air behind, so to speak. Um, it's, but I was driven not, I, I, I didn't have any money. Um, I was driven not to make money. I was driven because I loved what I was doing. And I would die to do it. And I did. I starved. And I had my electricity turned off because I couldn't pay a $50 bill. And I could. It didn't matter. I was going to do it some kind of way. I was going to do it. And I just, you know, if, if I made money, that was fine. If I didn't, that was fine. I just, this, I was driven to do it so bad that, you know, as I said at the time, I still do. It's the only thing I can do. So I might as well do all of it, you know. Whenever people would say, well, do you make more money from magazines? Do you make more money from prints? Do you make more money from speaking? Do you make more money from books? You say, no, you got to have, I got to have all of those to make one pile, you know? And if one of them falls off, I'm in trouble. And so it took every little avenue for me as far as making a living. Um, and I mean, putting food on the table and paying the bills and that's it. And, you know, you have some travel, but you do, you know, you do what you can with, you know, you, I drove everywhere I could, you know, I walked everywhere I could, said, you know, just did what I could. And, and then along the way, I had a lot of help. I met some great people who helped me, who let me stay at their places. And they had, you know, great wildlife areas and things like that and, and promoted things I did and bought the things I did. And so, I mean, you know, it just kind of works. So compare Jason. that to now, I think. What is it like now? I mean, obviously, you've got a lot of years into this and. Are you still doing all the speaking engagements? I mean, you, you look at your website and you're doing trips and workshops and you have your store, you have your books. You, you're still doing it all, right? This kind of leads into a, another story. Uh, Let's hear it. Uh, well, let me back up one second. I remember, you know, all of us, I'm assuming, and everybody that's ever shot anything and, and somebody knew who they were, whether they're a local guy, whether they're an international guy. And, you know, the saying is everybody says, I want to be you. You know, I want to do what you do. I want to be you. Well, over the years, I've had some people, you know, I, I don't know how y'all work, but I'm not, y'all are better than me because y'all get around with two and three and four guys and shoot. I can't stand to do that. I cannot stand to do that. I want to be by myself. I want to be the only one responsible for scaring this crazy thing off. I want to be the only one <laughs> responsible for missing the shot or getting the shot. And I like working alone. Um, but I've had some friends over the years that said, man, I want to go with you sometime. I just, I've got to go with you sometime. And without fail, every one of them left me. Every one. <laughs> because I was, I was hunting for this, this, this flower called a Catesby's trillium. I'm assuming you're familiar with trilliums. It's a plant out here for sure. And there's a number of species of it. And it grows around 3,000 feet. It grows pretty much in um, the Smoky Mountains area is, is where the main place. I found these in North Carolina. And so I was searching for these Kate's Beats Trillium this, this particular time. And I was, I'd been, I had a speaking engagement out in North Carolina. I was driving back. And one of my friends was out there. And he says, man, I want to come meet with you. I want to come meet you and go shoot with you. Now, he wasn't a photographer. He just wanted, he just wanted to hang along, you know. And so I said, well, look, I showed him a picture. I said, I'm looking for these case beast trilliums. We're going to have to hike up a ways. We have to get up to about 3,000 feet in some of these meadows and stuff. And we we'll would look for them. I said, they're, they're not very, they're not rare, but they're not very common. And I showed him what it looked like. I told him how big it was going to be, blah, blah, blah. We we're we up there for several hours and he found one. And he lost his mind. He thought he had discovered gold, you know. <laughs> And man, I got one. I got one over here. Look at this. Oh, oh here's another one. Here's another one. Well, you know, they end up being about 30, 40 plants in the area. So I started shooting. I'm analyzing the shot. I'm analyzing the look. I'm analyzing the light. I'm waiting on light, whatever it is. And about six hours later, he walks up to me. He says, give me the keys to the truck. I can't do this anymore. Six hours on a flower. Are you kidding me? And I said, this is the way it is. This is how, I, this is how it works. And I'm not coming back. So... I lost one. I get that. It's a whole patience thing, right? And that's, I think, someone that does this a lot, definitely, I mean, that's part of the game. And I think we enjoy that time just as much as we enjoy getting a good picture. Oh, I love exploring and finding stuff. I mean, I just get the biggest kick out of that. But you were, you were back to what you were talking, talking about nowadays. Um, 
nowadays I still have the same drive. Um, I, I don't do as many speaking engagements um, for many, for many. Of course, right now you can't do any because you can't go speak anywhere. Um, I still do a few workshops, maybe one every couple of years. Um, that whole that whole world has changed quite a bit. I used to I used to do a, 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 a an indoor workshop, like half day indoor and half day in the field. We'd have three hundred people in a workshop. Now you're lucky if you get three. Because everybody's got a phone and everybody's a photographer and, and you start talking about F stops and things like that. And they don't want to hear all that. You know, they just they want to let's, let's go find show me some wildlife and some flowers and stuff. I just want to take pictures. And it's like, OK, wait a minute. You got to got to know what you're doing you know, a little bit. So all that kind of has gone away um, in the spring of 2019. This will bring us kind of way forward. In the spring of 2019, I started getting a little anxious about things. And I started kind of looking around. I said, man, I've been doing this for 38 years. And it's kind of slowing. The industry has changed a lot. The way people look at books has changed a lot because so much online imagery is available. It just blows your mind, right? I mean, it's crazy. Um, I said, I need to do something else. And the only other something else I thought I could do was video. And I'd never shot video. And this is coming up, This, I mean, this is less than two years ago. And so I said, for me to shoot video, I need to see what this is all about. So I started getting online and I started looking and studying and seeing, well, okay, well, yeah, I got that. I had the outdoor experience and I had the nature stuff, I understood photography, but video is a whole different animal, whole different animal. And so I took crash courses in it and I, um, I said, okay, well, I don't really have the equipment I need for video to do like really good professional video. I don't I really need different cameras. I really need different tripods. I really need some monitors. I need better sound. I mean, I, I needed everything, but what I did, it's kind of the way I've always lived. I said, you know what? I've always, I've always said, if you can make a stick look good, you can make anything look good. And so get you a stick out there in the yard to make that sun gun look good. If you can make it look good, you can make you damn sure can make an elk look good. I can take. So I said with, with the equipment I have, the little bit of equipment I have, which was not good. I didn't have the right lenses that I needed for any of this. I said, and I, I was up in Canada that part of that summer. And I said, I'm going to make a short film with this trash that I have for video equipment. And if it's even half de decent, you know, I'm going to challenge myself. Can I shoot it? Can I edit it? Can I put a storyline together? Can I come up with a theme? Can I come up with a look? Can I come up with a feel? Can I come up with a story? And can I put all this together? And can it be just, just even interesting at all? It didn't have to be good. If I can accomplish that this summer, since I've only studied video about two months, I'm going to throw myself into this game. And I produced a piece that um, is called um, uh, Distant Call. It, it's on the Vimeo site too, and I'll have to open that up, um, and I will because I've got I've got it. It's locked for password, but I'll open it up. Um, it's about six minutes long. Um, it's, it's been in a couple competitions and it's actually done pretty well. Uh, I was pleased with it. It's not perfect. It's not great, but it was the first thing I ever did. And I said, uh, well, the, the one thing that happened me while I was doing it is I got the bug and that bug will drive you crazy. You know, you know, everybody knows that. Right. And so that's where I've moved into, I shoot, I shoot some stills now, but I, my focus is on video now and plus i've had some breaks along the way so that's what i'm doing these days yeah it's been it's been a while since you had a book a book published yeah I think the last and, one was 2010 is that right right is there any more plans for books in the future i mean you've got quite a few of them but in your in your repertoire there you've got like nine or ten books or eleven eleven books sorry wow yeah eleven coffee table books mm -hmm. and three or four other other publishers but i think 14 or 15 I'm, like I said, I'm doing one right now that I hope to I have out this either this summer or in the fall called 40 Years Wandering in the Wilderness. Oh, 
That's right. You did mention that. I apologize. Yep. And it's kind of a, a 40 year kind of anniversary kind of thing. And I'm, I'm going all the way back. And the, the biggest problem I've run into is like, I've got to choose a few photos out of gazillions. Right. Oh, yeah. And that's just really, all of a sudden I've hit a stop sign going, good God, I hope I can do this. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's all, most of it's already been written and now I'm in the editing stage and that's become very difficult. Plus I've, I've had other distractions and whatnot. So, um, but yes, that's I'm trying to have that out, and and one of the reasons is that back in 2010, I mean that, that book was a good book. It was it was very environmental, ecological, um, on some areas that uh, needed to be protected and, and watched and things like that. But the book business, the way I, the way I sold books was, is I had I, I sold books up front. In other words, I had to have sponsorships from corporate America and other businesses because you can lose your butt on books. I can tell you. And you end up losing forty thousand dollars, and you got three thousand copies sitting in your garage. You know, <laughs> so that, that's not good, and it doesn't go. It doesn't work good for your ego either. I can tell you. <laughs> so, when social media came around, that book stuff really went to the back burner. I mean, it just people didn't want to use the book as a as an advertising tool. It may come back around, kind of like the turntable. Um, but right now, at least in the last 10 years, it really hasn't because I've pursued it a couple of times and just came, just ended up against a brick wall. And I just said, well, I'm not going to beat myself to death. With, maybe one day it'll come back. Maybe one day it won't. And so that's the one reason I stopped doing that. I just couldn't get, I couldn't get the people to, to sponsor them. Yeah. Yeah. Social media is cheaper. <laughs> it's free. Yeah. <laughs> so speak. So yeah. So what so, took you underwater? Is that just something you wanted to explore and just a new challenge or was it because of where you live and the opportunities that that provided? No, I, I've always, I've always liked diving. I, I started diving illegally when I was a teenager. In other <laughs> words, I was not certified. Uh, I was never certified uh, until only about, 15, about 18 years ago. Um, I dove uncertified and uh, loved the underwater world. Just absolutely loved diving from a young age. And I started doing this and I was around water a lot. And I said, you know what? I want to get into this, you know, I want to get into some underwater and, and add another thing to my repertoire. Um, Cause I was always looking for something new to add. that was something else that somebody else couldn't offer or, you know, something that gave me another edge to do something or whatever. And I started out with, with what most people start out with, with Nikonis, which is, which is uh, like dinosaur, you know, the limitations of that thing are unbelievable, but the quality of the imagery when you got it was fantastic, you know, and um, got some really good stuff early on and flooded a few half dozen cameras and, <laughs> <laughs> and moved on from there. Uh, and then started shooting really good housings and stuff like that and some some you know high end stuff and I just love it. Yeah, you know, I just love it. What do you shoot now? What's your kit look like? As far as stills, mm -hmm. I shoot Nikon 800, eight hundred, uh, eight eight ten, Nikon. I used to shoot Nikon equipment. I, I was I was fixing to go the eight fifty way right when I that video bug bit and now I'm reassessing all that because. I'm going to have to go a different direction and I'm, I'm learning so much. I've been working with, with, uh, I've been lucky enough to work with, work on films for Nat Geo and BBC in the last 18 months, actually the last, no, last eight months. So and you started video in 2019 and you're already working on projects for the big guys. Right. Got, got fortunate. And I'm talking about, I'm, I'm beginning with them now. I'm, I'm starting as a helper and a second shooter and a problem solver and a nature guy and, you know, that kind of stuff and shooting along the way. And I, I'm, I'm loving it because it's all an education to me. And when you, when you're working for BBC, who is the absolute top of the heat as far as what they do, I'm looking at the equipment they use. I'm looking at the, at, at what they're demanding quality wise. Um, I'm looking at how they do things. I'm looking at the way they finance things. The cameras they're using, the lenses they're using, the ones they don't want you to use, blah, blah, blah. And so the educational part of it is instead of me going out there and buying some stuff and spending some money and wasting it on stuff that's not going to work, 
I'm sitting there looking at, well, this is what they're using and this is their, how they're doing it. And this is, uh, that's where I need, I need to go that direction, you know? So it's, it's actually guiding me pretty good and it's, it's been good so far, you know? I was going to say, I have a D850 for sale if you're still <laughs> in the market, but. <laughs> that's the second thing he's tried to sell on this call. <laughs> hey, so for our audience, can you just give us an idea of how you got into that, those jobs? So if you're going out and, like, did BBC search you out? You said earlier that you like to be out there by yourself and doing your own thing. Is it that knowledge that they tapped into? And did they find you first as a nature guy? And they're like, oh, well, we just need to go to Mississippi or we need to go somewhere that you're very familiar with. And this is the guy that's going to get us to where we need to be. Or did you have a buddy who's shooting and they needed an assistant and you got in that way? I know there's a million ways to do it. How did you do it? Well, I got in that last way, the buddy. Um, I got in, COVID took everybody's life away and gave me one. Um, Doug Gardner, who y'all know, I think, um, mm -hmm. started shooting video a while back when he had this TV show and, um, Doug and I go way back. I used to teach workshops for Doug back in the nineties. And then I worked in the Peruvian Amazon for over about 11 or 12 years and taught some workshops in the Amazon. And Doug came to one of those one year. He came down to the Amazon with me with several other students. And so I did a lot of teaching and that's where I met Doug. And, and Doug's a great guy. And we, we got along and he's he, he's 15 years younger than I am, but still we, we've been friends for a long time. I have a lot of respect for Doug. I'm assuming he has a lot of respect for me. But anyway, COVID came along and Doug had this assignment that he was working on. And Doug can tell the story, but I'll give you a brief glimpse of it. COVID hit when the assignment was supposed to start. And the production company out of Bristol, you know, all these, everything's out of Bristol, right? Um, said, you can't go. And he said, what do you mean? If I can't go, we're going to miss this shot we're trying to get. And it'll be another 12 months. A lot of things in nature are seasonal, right? You miss it this year. It's another 12 months before you get a chance again. And so they said, well, we can't give you a contract because the COVID thing just hit and everybody's confused. And, and, you know, and these are, these are bureaucratic businesses, you know, they're run by big corporations and they got many, lots of lawyers and blah, blah, blah. It's not like I want to go or you want to go. We just go out and do it. Right. But you can't do that with them. So Doug basically said, well, y'all work all this out. I'm going, got this car and took off. Well, he was going to get something that they had been working on and setting up and there it was kind of like well we're gonna have to either pay him now or pay him later because he's gonna get the footage and he's gonna nail us probably with it <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna want it and so he could tell you the rest of that story but he was alone and normally you'd have a couple of shooters and probably four or five producers and you'd have this, this staff of people that and i've learned all this this just blows your mind it's like, okay, we don't need all these people, you know, but in my mind, cause I work alone, uh, and I do everything. So <clears throat> he was over there stuck in this, in this situation with no help, with no backup, with no dip, with no anything. And he told, um, the people, the production people he was working for, he says, I've got to have a helper. And they said, yes, and you got to have somebody because everything with them, which I appreciate everything is about safety. Everything is about safety, whether it's alligators are going to eat you or the weather's really bad or you're in situations where somebody at least needs to be there. That if you do die, they need to go get you. I mean, whatever, you know, and they're all about safety. And they said, we've got to have somebody with you. You can't be out there working alone. And they said, do you know somebody? And he said, I know somebody. You need to call him right now. And so they called me. And they didn't know me from Adam, but Doug said, you need this guy. I appreciate that. And I will forever. And, um, but I couldn't go. I was an hour and 15 minutes away from where he was sitting and I couldn't go. I mean, I could go, but I wouldn't be under contract and I wouldn't have got paid. And they said, until we get what had happened at that point, this was last spring. Disney had just bought Nat Geo films. Now they're under Disney nature. And so they had bought them, I think maybe the first of March or something like that. It was right when the COVID situation, it all happened at one time. 
And so they had this transfer of power and contracts and, and safety and and then all of a sudden you got COVID. Nobody knows what to do with this. It's brand new, right? And so they, I was talking to them every day and they said, get all your stuff ready. We got your contract ready. I had to fill out nine million forms and do all kinds of stuff online for insurance and for safety and for this and for that. And you, know, you got to have your banking and, you know, everything because I was brand new. And I kept waiting. I kept waiting. And they like said, they call me every day. Disney had not given us approval. Disney had not given us approval. Disney had not given us approval. Well, finally, they gave approval. We got together several weeks after he had already, after Doug had already been shooting. That pulled us to another job that had to do with that job. Then that pulled us to another job when we went on another job that had some areas of expertise that Doug was going on. Then I've, I've gotten to know these people. So then they call me and say, we use you for that. Can you do this? And then another, you know, production company on another film, not Nat Geo, but Discovery or somebody, they called. And it's just, it's just been like lucky. Yeah. I mean, that's what I can describe it as lucky. So let's dig into, so that's kind of the corporate-y kind of, how do you get inside? But so if you started video not that long ago, where's your mind at now? I mean, now that you're like, okay, well, I'm shooting this Nikon stuff, but I know that you know, a lot of these big time productions, they want 4k, at least 4k, if not more, they want, they want high, high frame rate stuff. Right. So where's your mind at for cameras at that point? Are you looking at airy? Are you looking at red? Are you looking at black magic or what, what's your thought process based off of the, not what you get to see that these guys are using out there? Um, my head is red as a primary. Um, we're shooting Sony A7S threes right now for the trap stuff. Uh, the Canon, you notice I haven't said Nikon yet. <laughs> the Canon equipment is w way up there. The R5 is a really cool new camera out there. Um, I've worked with a number of camera uh, Canon cameras since I've been fooling with these uh, these shoots, and uh, the Luminix. Is, is, is a good setup. Um, learning the lens setups they want to use for whatever has been very educational. Uh, just understanding the mindset of what they want directs you in the camera gear area, you know. And right. so, you know, when I first start, I'm looking at Doug was shooting something somewhere and I looked, I looked at his um, setup and I said, Doug, is that your setup? And he said, no. I said, why? He says, this setup is $165,000. He said, well, that rules me out. And I can tell you that right now. <laughs> oh, they provide it. It's just that's how much it costs. You know, I'm going, right. oh, good grief, you know. Um, but there, you don't have to shoot with that much stuff and that kind of stuff all the time. But, yeah, they want to shoot. They're, they're producing everything in 4K, but they're shooting in 6 and 8K because they want the ability. You can always dial it back right i mean you can always bring it down but they also want the ability to take an 8k shot and crop it 4k that gives them a whole no leeway of moving around that frame and getting what they want so sometimes they're demanding depending on the subject depending on what you're shooting they're demanding you know six or 8k or some somewhere in that area because they want that ability to be able to crop and move around um which has been kind of interesting yeah so uh, like I said, I'm still learning. I'm learning a lot. I'm learning fast. So do you think, sorry guys, I'm coming during the conversation oh, here, but go for it. Do you think that your eye as a photographer give you, gives, gives you a leg up as opposed to like, say if you started out as a videographer and moved to a photographer and then compare that to a photographer going to a videographer, my mindset's always been, if you start out as a photographer, you got that composition down. You just need to figure out how to add movement to it. And I think that ends up being a better formula as opposed to a videographer that tries, that goes to the photography thing. What's, where's your mind at there? Do you think that that stands true? What I think, or do you think that starting out as a videographer and going to a photographer's? You know, that's, I guess that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I hadn't been the videographer first, so I don't know. But I know in stills, 
at least in my training, I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't shoot lots of shots in a, in a sequence. I mean, I've always shot one or two or maybe three, but you're always following the action. You're always, you know, kind of moving with it, which is kind of like a video thing. And then you're picking up that moment that you bam, you hit it, you know, that kind of a thing. So I think that kind of helps. Um, the mindset for the video is, is a more storing, a storytelling mindset in a sequence as opposed to a single shot. Um, so I think there's a little bit of different, um, you got to keep your head kind of in a different place to think about what you're fixing to do in a sequence. Um, and also how you, how you going to creatively make this video shot better than just following an elk walking across the field or following an alligator swimming across the swamp. What can you do with it to, from the viewer's point of view, that's like, oh, wow, that's cool. Or that surprised me, or I didn't think that was going to be there. You know, like, so it's, it's, it's kind of like out thinking the shot and trying to find a new way to shoot it. Um, I, I'm probably going to get in trouble for saying this. Um, but I find most nature films extremely boring, extremely boring. Um, I don't watch a lot of nature TV. Um, I never have liked hunting and fishing shows and videos very much because I just thought they were ridiculously bad. Um, so I, I, my head is, is kind of in a different place. And um, I hope to at some point, if I live long enough and I'm good enough and that both of those are questionable, uh, do something on my own, um, that I can produce my own pieces and shoot them the way I want and produce, produce them the way I want and edit them the way I want. And, you know, I, I like, I, I'm a control guy. I've always done it all. And I still kind of think that way. Um, and I know, I know as far as Doug, Doug and I have talked about some pro doing some projects together too. And he has the same kind of mindset because he, he's already done it. You know, he did a lot of TV shows and stuff, but now he's coming back around from the other side going, wait a minute, I've learned a lot here. Um, and it may not happen. I mean, all that stuff is, is money and power. And, you know, I just like creating stuff. I, you know, now when you get into the, the, the big boys world, the money and the finance and all that kind of stuff and the, and the, and the the backbiting and stuff like like there is and everything. I, I don't know if, if I would deal with it very well if I got into that, but um, I'm just kind of I'm just kind of a good old boy and a purist and just kind of just want to do what I want to do, you know. What's the coolest thing that you've seen or learned along the way where you're like, that is just the best? I mean, because I'm I'm in the same situation as you, where you go out with a lot of these crews and you look at stuff and you're like, oh, that's cool, or I can't, you know, that is so easy i would have never thought out of it i would have made it way more difficult is there anything that just stands out in your mind where you look at something that they bring on set or they bring to a shoot and you're like ah oh, that is just the perfect way to do exactly what we're trying to do here i've only had nine months of experience so i'm kind of limited a lot of it has been learning um and and just sucking absorbing every inch of everything up and when somebody's an expert at something We'll have somebody come do a setup, uh, and they're expert on on setting up traps. Well, you know what? Guess what? I'm learning everything I can about that. You know, somebody's really good with long lens, and what, what are they doing there? And they're just really watching that. Somebody's shooting some some wides and some movements, and then you're getting into um, time lapse, and you're getting into all the creative things that go along with all that. And all these are little different tools, right, to put together a piece. Because at the end, all these little things uh, are for the end piece. So I haven't seen I haven't seen anything. I think what you were talking about as far as like equipment and stuff, but but maybe in a different, more philosophical way. The way I'm seeing, okay, well, like we'll go on a shoot, and we're gonna be there, you know, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and we're taking. We're trying with all this equipment and all this time and all this money and all these people, the people has been actually a low thing now because of the COVID they can't, people can't fly and can't get places. Which is kind of so, awesome. Yeah. For me, cause we've got <laughs> these little shoestring groups, you know, one and two and three people. That's like perfect. That's at seven or eight. I may not have a job. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> they might decide it. We need to get rid of this guy. Right. Um, but what I've seen is, is that all this, emphasis on something that's probably going to produce maybe 60 seconds in the final cut maybe 
you know? And to have the ability to do that with the different setups, okay, we need this, we need that wide, we need this shot, we need this sequence, we need a long lens for that, we need this, and all put together. Because we get these shot lists, like when we were shooting in September, August and September, we had a shot list with 400 shots on. 400 shots. Now, it's a wish list, right? It's a wish list. But it's got 400 shots. Well, first thing we do is go down, Doug and I will go down the list and go, not going to happen. Not going <laughs> to happen. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. I mean, you know, they're basing this on a wish list. And then, then you start to say, okay, now we whittle it down to 300 shots. <laughs> we, we still got all this stuff to, to, to try to accomplish. And that's one of the things I love about that particular thing. I love problem solving with nature. It's like, okay, now this shot is really important. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? And we don't have any limitations. How are we going to do that? And we have to sit down and work it out. And if we come up with a plan and the plan calls for, we're going to need X, Y, Z equipment and X, Y, Z time and X, Y, Z, this, that, and the other. And they look at it and they think there's a good chance we're going to accomplish it. Bam, it happens. I can't do that on my own, but they can. Right. Now, we still have to accomplish the shot, but at least we have the tools to try to accomplish the shot. And to me, seeing all this come together and all these pieces of, of somebody over here doing that, and I'm sitting in a blind 12 hours a day doing this, and somebody else is running around pulling um, trap cameras and moving them around and leaving them there, and blah, 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 all to get this 60 seconds of, of footage that maybe will make it to the hour show. I love it. I got some more stuff, but I don't want to commandeer it. If you guys want, if you guys have something, go for it. I have a question, but it's kind of back to the website, and I don't want to shift gears too hard, Mike. If you still have some video stuff, yeah, I do. I do have one thing. So, I've been focusing this last year on every every time I go out, trying to get more and more video, just to start to and and learning. Um, Michael and I met because we both co-hosted one of Doug's TV shows with him, and basically we were just the guides. Um, or in my case, I was, so that is what kind of started the video bug, but that's been four or five years ago now. And so now I'm starting to get a little bit more serious about it. We've gone to the R5, but I've realized that that's not, that's not the end all either. Um, but more importantly, what I've, what I've found is the most important piece of gear in a video kit is the tripod. How did you make that transition from, did you shoot on a Wimberley? You said you were in the water a lot. Did you shoot on a Wimberley or did you shoot handheld primarily for your stills? And how'd you make that transition to a fluid head? I've never had really expensive tripods. I had sturdy tripods, but not expensive tripods. I've never used a Wimberley in my life. Um, I shoot on a ball head most of the time. Um, I, I'm so hard on my equipment and stuff was always in the mud in a swamp, all the way to the top of the ball head. So ruining stuff happened constantly. So having a $2,000 tripod was ridiculous because I was going to have to replace it six months anyway and having to have more than one. And so I used, I, I used my Infrato stuff a lot. It was really decently made. Um, and it wasn't super overly expensive. Uh, and just used it as a tool to get the shot. And if I needed to modify it some kind of way, whatever, to get the shot, I would. Um, and I'd always base it around, what do I need for this shot? Or what do I need for this setup? And, and I'll, 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 br I'll cut the leg off with a hacksaw if I have to and move it over here and stick it in a tree or whatever, you know, it's, and that's just kind of the way I've always approached it. Um, but yes, the video stuff with fluid heads, and the head you have to have, you know, here's here's a here's a tripod. The tripod is thirty seven thousand dollars, thirty seven thousand dollar freaking tripod. <laughs> and the most I've ever spent on one is five hundred. So <laughs> I'm I'm trying to get my head around this. OK. Um, and, and it's important. It's very important. Uh, this, and when you shoot with long lenses and you shoot an 8K, you got all kind of problems. I mean, everything shows up, you know, mm -hmm. and. You, a CN20, you shooting it, you can shoot at 1500 millimeters. I mean, you know, oh my God, you know, it's just, if you breathe it, it, holding, holding the handle with that CN20 at 1500, it picks up your heartbeat. It, it, it does this. 
it picks up your heartbeat by, with your hand on the hand. I, it's, it's amazing. So yeah, I, I'm still getting my head around um, some of the tripods stuff, but you got to, you got you, you for sure. I don't know if you have to have a 37,000 one. If you do, if you got really, really big equipment because of the weight, you know, you have to have a really big system because if you got something that weighs 40 pounds, well, you got, you know, that's a lot to study. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a whole nother world. And ball head is important. Explain what that CN20 is. The CN20 is a lens that basically BBC said, we need something, can you invent it? And if you look up the story of the invention of the CN20, it's very interesting because it took, you know, all these engineers, all this, this stuff, um, these, these people to come together, be it because of lenses or be, um, I'm talking about lenses inside the, 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 the lens, uh, the metal work, the, 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 the mathematics figuring out how this thing is going to work. And, and the two biggest, well, there's a couple things that it's really that particular lens, that particular lens, by the way, sells for $72,000. <laughs> okay. And if you want to see a lot of them turn on a golf tournament or a sporting event, and that's what they're broadcasting with, especially golf tournaments. They're seeing twenties all over the freaking place. Just every every Cameron has one. Um, it's they go from fifty to a thousand, so you have the complete range of backing all the way off to bringing it all the way in. Okay. One of the things they wanted to do, which our modern lenses do not do, is that it would not change the focal plane moving from 1,000 to 50. You and I know that once you do with a zoom lens, you start back, when you, once you start changing that focal length, you got to refocus. You know, it's going out of focus because of the because of the way it moves. Well, they had to invent a lens, but that did not happen. And just like when you when you get the, the that lens set up for shooting, you have to you have a focus chart that you use and you fo focus it at a thousand and make all the settings. Then you back it off to 50 and you focus and you make all the settings. And that way it's all the way through. It's in perfect focus, which is unbelievable. Just unbelievable. The smoothness of how it works. It's, it's a thousand at six, three, which is pretty daggum good. Um, it, it's, it's just an amazing piece of equipment with motors on it. And it, it's, yeah, yeah, it's impressive. It's impressive. And it'll do a lot. And you need a big, fat $37,000 tripod to hold that sucker up. Exactly. When you put that, when you put the camera with the red on it and, and extra monitors and, and extra batteries, whatever you need, and you put that, that tripod on your back, you've got 78 pounds you're fixing to carry around. And that ain't fun. <laughs> when I was younger, it was a lot easier than it is now. I can right. tell you. Yeah. Right. Well, you need to get another guy to just carry the, or guy or gal just to carry the tripod. Absolutely. Sherpas. American Sherpas. Yep. <laughs> so I, I just have one more question and then we can bring it back to the website. Unless you have something wrong. No, that's, that was what I was curious about. So do you look at all those things? So earlier you mentioned you got the long lens, you got the camera traps, you got the time lapse, you got the slow-mo, you got all these little specialty things. Right. And with you getting into this video, do you look at any one of those and say, man, I just want to be the best at this. I want to be the best long lens guy out there. Or I want to be the best uh, camera trap guy out there. Or do you feel like this, I just need to know how to do it all. I need to know how to do it all. Um, <clears throat> not because I need to do it all, but I need to know how to do it all. Because... If, if I were to move on, like at my age and my experience and, and what I want to do going forward is to produce things myself. Um, it's like starting in a mailroom, right? If you get to go from the mailroom to the president, you know, everybody's job all in between and nobody can pull any crap on you. Right. So I feel like even if I don't shoot the stuff or use the stuff, at least I need to know all about it. Um, so I can so I can, you know, at least. When somebody argues with me saying we can't do that, I'm going, yes, you can. Don't tell me you can't. <laughs> uh, or, or vice versa, right? Right. Um, so now what I should say is I want to specialize in that because you're going to get a lot more jobs if you're the best trap guy around or the best long lens guy around or the best or, or the best lighting guy around. You know, I mean, 
we you, you have a shoot, okay, and you're trying to mock moonlight, right? Because um, not every night has a moon. If you're shooting at night, you need night light. It needs to look natural. It needs to look like moonlight, and it needs to have certain angles and certain um, values and temperatures and whatnot. There's a couple guys, that's all they do. And they make one hell of a living out of setting up moonlight. That's all they do, you know? Because when you need somebody, guess what? That's who you call them. Right. And so when you specialize in something, you're going to probably have steadier stuff to do. You know, a jack of all trades, like I'm, I kind of always been. It's kind of like I can do it all, but, you know, am, am I out the best at any part of it? I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm not. Um, but I, I think when you, I, I think people remember your name if you're the, you know, if you're the best trap guy, or the best lighting guy, or the best long lens guy, or the, or the best problem solving guy, whatever it is, you know, um, you probably, your probably name is on a shorter list, probably. Yep. Um, I, I just don't have the ability to do that. For one thing, I get bored really, really easy. And, uh, but it's amazing. I can sit in the, I can sit in the blind for 14 hours and I'm fine, but I can't sit at a red light when it turns green and if somebody's looking at their phone, it drives me crazy. That's <laughs> 20 seconds. You know? That's because they're wasting your time and that's not it's cool. Not, I guess. I <laughs> I'm with you there. Hey, Jason, yeah. what was your question about the uh, website? Yeah, so I was just perusing through your uh, website there, and I came across this one. It's on the, the the toolbar side there, and it's it says Mimicrist. So I went ahead and clicked on that, and that's kind of intriguing to me. Um, it looks like you've also got uh, maybe some camouflage that you've created through your photography. Maybe just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a long story. We need to make it very short. Okay. Um, <laughs> And I don't know how to do that. Uh, I was called by a guy a number of years ago, back in 2006 or seven, I can't remember. And he said, told me his name. Uh, I, did, I didn't know who he was. Um, and said, we need to meet and get together. And I've got a business opportunity that I need to employ you for. Sorry, we have dogs and somebody's ringing the doorbell. For That's whatever. right. That's all good. Um, so I said, okay. I had no idea what it was about. And I went and met him. And he said, you're, you're the waterfowl guy. I, the first, my book, Whistling Wings, was the first book ever published. It was all ducks in flight. Never, it had never been accomplished before. Um, and he says, you're the, you're the waterfowl guy. You're the, you're the photographer guy. I need your services. I said, what is that? He says, I've got an idea for camouflage. And I said, okay, well, tell me about it. He said, every duck hunter wears deer hunter camouflage, right? Basically, turkey hunters, all, they all wear one kind of camouflage. He said, waterfowl are in water. We need camouflage with water in it for waterfowl hunters. Great idea. I get it. Nobody had ever done it before. So he says, I need you to take some pictures of marshy, swampy situations um, that you're used to being in. I started duck hunting when I was seven. So, I mean, and that's my favorite thing is ducks. Um, and basically what I did was went out and shot some swampy situations. And I said, what you don't understand about photography is shooting water is one of the most tricky things you will ever do because you can't take a picture of water. I mean, you either got reflections, you got to deal with special filters. And then if you take all the, all the water qualities out of it, you go right through it in a polarizing kind of way. And you can't even tell there's water there. I mean, so it's, it's this tricky situation that I want to see water, but I don't want to see water. You know, I don't want it reflecting blah, blah. And I said, well, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, I'm going to take your pictures and I'm going to give them to a, an artist and they're going to create the camo, which is what most camos made. It's made in Photoshop and layers or, or you put some leaves, you take pictures of leaves, you take pictures of sticks and you mix them all together. Right. And then you make this pattern of things. That's the way it's always kind of been done. And I'm over here in the middle of camouflage central over here in Mississippi. And so I said, well, why do you want to give it to an artist? And he said, well, because they need to paint it. And I said, you don't need to paint this. 
I said, we can make camo straight from the images. Now I'm shooting these on film. Uh, and he said, what? I said, we'll just take a photographic image and make that the camo. He said, can you do that? I'm going, yeah, that's no problem at all. So that turned into a company that was called Muddy Water Camo. And there's a reason I don't want to talk about this a lot is because the whole thing ended up in humongous lawsuits. Huh. Um, we invented something. I came up with a way of doing it. We invented something that had never been done before that put us on Shark Tank and five and a half minutes on CNN. Hmm. I was on both of those. And we had beaten the big boys to the punch with this method of making camouflage. And camouflage business, I don't know how much y'all know about it, but camouflage business is freaking huge. Yeah. Huge. Uh, the numbers are just unbelievable. Um, and so when that all went the wrong direction, for me, I was, I, there was two of us, the guy that called me and me were the owners. And then we had investors. And the investment situation went bad. And, and in my opinion, it's because somebody saw, when people see dollar signs, they go nutty, right? And we were fixing to be multimillionaires and overnight. And so member groups came out of that. So let's answer your question a long way around. Um, I took an, another guy and I out of that company and we took our patent. I, we got a new patent uh, and went from there to there. And so that's where that came from. Is it true that a camel pattern has to never end? Like if you, I, I'm guessing here, but if you had a tile, you know, if you take your picture and that is the the start of this camel pattern, does it have to seamlessly go into the next thing so that when you produce a fabric or when you're producing whatever that's going to be camo, that you'd never see a seam or you never see a line? Is that how does that work? Or is that is that am I infringing on patent super secret patent stuff? No, no. Okay. Well, let's let's, let's go way back and make it real simple. A curtain hanging on a wall with a pattern on it. It doesn't end even though you see the same image or wallpaper, mm -hmm. see the same image, right? But you never see a place of beginning or ending, right? It just magically goes into the name and, and just keeps repeating. And that's what we call making a repeat. So when I create, depending on how the printing will fix it, see now we're getting in a whole other category of things, <laughs> getting into fabric and printing and right. methods of printing and kind of printing and with a printing press, the ones we use for most fabric are 60 inches. Life-size images were, I'm creating were about 30 inches. So you're gonna have at least one repeat in the middle, right? And then you got one repeat on the top and bottom because it's got to blend both ways. Right. Because your piece is 30, let's just say it's 34 by 24. Okay, that's gonna repeat on top, bottom, and both sides. Right. So that has to be created, that repeat, especially when it's not, with a curtain, you got to have a lot of backspace, you know, like white space or dark space with some little things. Okay, we're talking about sticks and branches and right. a million things going on. Yeah. The repeats take 20 times longer to create an image because I've got to work out that this stick has got to be repeated on that other side of this thing. This stick over here has to end up on this side of this thing. And so, and making it seamless with a million pieces of cattail sticks, whatever it is in this picture is takes, Oh my God, it just takes hours, days and of me working on a computer, just getting it to where you can't tell. Mm -hmm. And then we need to know the specs of what we're, how we're printing it, what we're going to, what clients we're using it for, what kind of patterns we're using it for, what kind of clothing we're using it for, blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot involved in it, but yes, to answer your question, it has to be repeated so you can't tell where it starts and where it ends. I just had heard that at one point and I thought, I just, since you've done it, I just wanted to ask and it yeah. makes sense, but I just, I've tried it and I never got it, but I only spent like 20 minutes. Yeah. You can get it. That it enough. It's just a lot of work. It's just tedious work. It's right. you know you gotta visualize it and then you gotta kind of pick the which way do you want to go. I want do I want to go to the top to the bottom from the bottom to the top. That sounds crazy because you're both you're going from the top to the bottom on both of them, but not really. One's got to be dominant, bleeding into the other one. You know, so you make those decisions based on shapes and patterns and colors and you know highlights and 
low lights and blah blah blah. So it's 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 kind of a it's a it's a Photoshop thing, you know. It's it's um, and then you're using your head to make sure it looks good, you know. Right. Yeah, it's funny. That's a great question because I'm a, I'm actually looking at it on the website right now, and now that you say that, I can actually kind of look at the tops, bottoms, sides, and see how it would repeat and tie together. That's pretty yeah. cool. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta be able to butt them up against yeah. each other, and you can't tell whether it's stopped. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's relevant to all of us, whether we're hunters or photographers, right? We all of us with the wildlife and nature stuff use camo for, yeah. for our craft. So, absolutely. So that's how I got into that, and that was another departure of things that I did. <laughs> huh. It was another department. You've got several departments going on in that office. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, and, and then what happened was, uh, CNN came down here and did a really good piece on us. You know, five minutes on CNN news is freaking hard to get. I can tell you that. And then 12 minutes on Shark Tank after all the crap you have to go through. And that's a whole nother interview because the Shark Tank thing was just a, a six months of unbelievable stuff that we had to do. I mean, they, we were one, they, they filmed 112 episodes that year and it was 38,000 applicants oh. on the show. So, and the weeding out process is crazy. Um, but I got on that show and talked to the sharks because what? Speaking engagements. <laughs> I, I can memorize lines. I can sell them, whatever, you know? So, I mean, that kind of worked into the thing too. So, I mean, it's just kind of crazy, you know? You never know what kind of skill you have that can be used. It has nothing to do with a camera or, or a, a wildlife knowledge or walking across a mountain or whatever, you know? But it all started yeah, with that you... little Vivitar lens. Yeah. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. yeah, I think you've just a great example of how you really need to be able to reach into your toolbox of life experiences and education and whatever just to pull things together and make this work. You know, it's a uh, it's pretty incredible. And and you know, Doug, not to bring up Doug a lot, but Doug's done that. You know, he he Doug's Doug's a smart guy, and he and he he's a problem solver extraordinaire. And he takes all the skills and the things he's learned and and, and had to unlearn and everything else. He puts all those things together in a very unique way. And um, we've been working together a lot on projects because I, this is just me. I mean, Doug may feel differently and producers may feel differently. But between the two of us, we probably can do anything, you know, and or at least we won't figure it out. And so it's been real easy for us to work together. We're friends, for one thing. Um, but it's been easiest to work together because we can kind of look at each other and he can tell when I don't know what's going on, and I can tell when he doesn't know what's going on. You know that kind of deal. So uh, yeah, it's kind of a complimentary package. You know? Yeah, I can tell you firsthand what Doug cannot get accomplished. What's that? Getting his Tahoe out of a snowbank. <laughs> <laughs> it would have happened eventually, but it would have taken him a lot longer. <laughs> well, I got a, I got a funny story with Doug. We were in the Amazon jungle. We were on a riverboat, and about the seventh day, he came out of his room, and these rooms are tiny. They're like five feet by four feet. You know, I mean, it's a little bitty, horrible hot and everything else. And he came out on the seventh day, and, he, and everybody the workshop was all on the back deck having lunch or breakfast or something. And he came out of his room, and he says, hey, man, did you know that fan in there has three speeds? I was like, <laughs> Dude, it's the seventh day. <laughs> and it was on low, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I think what you're what you're talking about, and we're kind of poking fun a little bit, but what you're talking about is is something that came up uh, last winter. I was up filming with Doug, and we were we were doing a podcast filming sheep. Uh, did a quick podcast just while he was there. And one question that we constantly get asked is, "What does it take to become a professional?" And I think everybody wants the easy. Well, you talk to this guy, you know, you. You do this, you do that. And I think the the answer that we came up with that night is you just get the job done. Yeah. Somebody sends you out to get an image, you find a way to do it. And it doesn't matter what the image is. Uh, it's probably not going to be easy to get, but you figure out the way to do it. Figure out the way that is going to produce the best product and and represent that in the best way. And I think that's exactly what it takes. And what you're talking about, kind of being the the jack of all trades, just contributes itself to that outcome. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to learn because you don't know 
what somebody might ask you to do at some point. Yeah, I mean, okay, and I'm a perfect example. If I am an example, at 64 years old, deciding I need to do something different, I'm going to start this video world, which is as complicated as all get out. I mean, if you really want to get deep in the weeds with it, it's very complicated. But my philosophy is all I need to do, the camera, the camera is not going to go out there and do anything without me. Except I've learned that's different. Trap cameras can. <laughs> but you still have to set them up, right? Right. So... I'm using, I'm not, I'm not letting it be, it's real easy to let the equipment and the technology scare you and overwhelm you. That's very easy to do, but I'm looking at it. I've got to get something accomplished and I've got to use that to accomplish it. And all I got to do is figure out which buttons to push and which, you know, I'm, I'm probably not the best technical shooter that there is as far as knowing every little wire and every little thing, but if I can get it working and I can get what's in front of me, in front of me the way I want it, then we can get the image. And at the end of the day, that's all that really matters. And that, and that goes the same for still photography too. When people say digital and film and big and lens and expensive and, and cheap and everything else, baby, I don't care what you take it with. You get, you get a purple polar bear and you could shoot it on a piece of garbage and you're going to make a million dollars because you captured a purple polar bear. At the end of the day, you get the right image. The arguments, whether you have good equipment or cheap equipment or, what model, what brand, whatever, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you got it, right? I mean, it's the end result that matters, correct? Yep, yep. for sure. Yep. Hey, I got one last question before we wrap this thing up because we've been going for an hour and a half already. <laughs> what, so you said earlier you get 12 images in your lifetime? How many have you got so far? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I guess it's your measuring stick. Um, I don't want to tell you a number because then you're going to ask me which ones they are. <laughs> <laughs> we won't hold you to that. Really back me in a corner. Yeah. No, I won't do that. I will. <laughs> and I'm not sure I can produce them. Um, wow. I'm still looking for them. I mean, they, I, I feel like I have, it, you know, it's, it's not the images People think, what are those 12 images or the 10 images or the four or whatever they are? They think of your most famous shot or the one that made the most money or the one that got published the most or, or the one that won the, you know, the Ansel Adams Award or whatever. That's not the 12 I'm talking about. I'm talking about the 12 that blow me away. And where I'm coming from with that is, is when I was first, well, not first, but early on in my career, we used to send out to editors at magazines a page of slides and a page of slides. You had 20 slides, right? And you, they, they, they do a call for they're looking for it, whatever. And so you'd send the slides FedEx or in the mail, whatever to out Audubon magazine or natural history magazine or national geographic, or whoever, whoever it is that you got the call for and they're looking for these images. And it just so happened to be the editor at Natural History Magazine one year, and it was one of the first submissions I had made, and they had had a call out for, I can't even remember what it was, it doesn't really matter. And she called me back in the days when people talked on the telephone a lot. <laughs> she called me and she said, Steve, you have some really good stuff here, but you've made one huge mistake with your submission. And I said, uh-oh, what's that? She said, you sent me too much stuff. And she said, your weak images have ruined your strong images. Wow. Don't send me 40 that you really like. Send me 10 that I can't get my eyes off of. Hmm. And it was like, okay, well, that's a revelation. And she said, I can also see you sent me some images. Now, how she knew this, I don't know. You sent me some images that I got a feeling that you're in love with. And I said, yeah, I don't know the story. And I don't care. It's got to work in the magazine. And I, and that taught me a lot, you know, because a lot of people say, well, you don't know how I got that shot, man. I had to wait five days. I had to walk, hike 30 miles. And you don't understand it was snowing that morning. The sun came out and I saw him. Then he did this and did that. I got that shot and everything else. I'm looking at the picture going, I don't give a crap what you did. This is a terrible <laughs> shot. <laughs> you, know, you had a great time getting that shot and it means a lot to you, you know? And I'm, that, so that's where I'm talking about the back to the 12, the, the, the 10 or 12 images 
that really mean a lot to me may have a lot to do with the story and nobody cares about. I mean, telling the story is one thing, but as far as the final image being that good and what I had to do to get this image, you'll never appreciate it like I do. That's kind of where I'm going with that. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. I think I, it's good for people to hear that too. We talk, I think we've talked about this a couple of times, but you know, you get those iconic images over your career and there's not that many of them that, that set you apart. No, and of course, everybody, I mean, everybody's got a different opinion about it, right? It's all subjective. I, I got a quick story. When I, when I, own, when I first I owned a gallery, a, an art gallery for several years, and I, I did it just to learn the business because I, I was one of the first photographers that started producing lithographs. Instead of photographic prints, you know, um, I went to the lithograph arena and I found out I could make a, if, if I had a successful image, I could make a lot more money because I could print them for a dollar a piece. If I sold a thousand, I, you know, I, there was a number I had to sell to break even, like 30 or 40. If I can't sell 30 or 40 of this image, uh, then forget it, you know. Um, you just do them one at a time. At that point, you're making money on each one, right? So anyway, I had a gallery and I was learning all this stuff about about images and printing and framing and selling and, 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 and kind of getting stuff out there to other frame shops and to other places where they sold your image. Somebody else is selling my stuff. This woman called me and she said, um, Mr. Kirkpatrick, I'm, a, I'm an artist and uh, I would like to get into your gallery. And I said, she said, what do I need to do? And I said, well, it's not that big a deal. Just you have to bring me some whatever you, I said, are you a painter? And she says, yeah, I paint oils. And I said, that's fine. I said, uh, you need to bring me in something to look at. And if I, if I think I can sell it and I think it's good, we'll go. And if I don't, I won't. And she said, fair enough. So she came in, she walked in, she had her, a painting, I could tell in her frame and she had it in some kind of, some kind of material covered up like a bag kind of a thing. And she said, and she told me, she walked in, she told me her name, blah, blah, blah. We talked for a moment. She said, before I show you this painting, there's one thing I need to tell you. And I said, what's that? She said, if you don't like this painting, I'm never going to paint again. Okay, number one, that's way unfair. <laughs> right. And I looked her straight in the eye, and I don't even know where this wisdom came from, but I looked her straight in the eye and said, do not take that painting out of that bag. <laughs> said, what? I said, do not take that painting out of that bag. And she says, why? I said, if my opinion stops you from painting, you are not a painter. And she stormed out. Wow. <laughs> You paint because you got to and you can't stop. You don't paint because somebody says, you know, I don't like. Right. Yeah. She should have said, she should have said, well, you almost quit when that quail jumped off that log. <laughs> <laughs> but nobody was telling me that except me. <laughs> no, that's a, that's a great point. And I, I think, you know, there's a lot of people out there that are diving headlong into this and the equipment is so readily available to people now, you know, you can buy a, a 600 millimeter lens for a thousand dollars now, yeah. you know, 150 to 600, either Sigma or Tamron. Um, they've got been on those sale for 750 last week. Oh, really? Black That's Friday. The 150 to six. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I, where that's available to people, there are some people out there that have just picked up a camera that are making outstanding images. But I think that, you know, the everybody wants to make the sale. Everybody wants to jump in the website right away. The thing to remember is that you're doing this for you. Absolutely. And if people don't want to buy your images, if they don't want to publish your images right away, that means nothing except just get better figure out what they want to see, not what you want to see. But in the end, we all do it for ourselves because we enjoy it. We do it to make a living, but we do it because we enjoy it. And I think that that comes shining through in everything that you've said tonight. It's just one challenge after another and the boredom gets overtaken easily by the next step. <laughs> so I, uh, when I talked to Doug last week, and your name came up, or a week and a half ago, your name came up uh, that you guys had been working together on another project. 
And I, the first thing I said, he, the way he was talking about you kind of got me excited. And then I said, you think he'd be a good guest? He's like, yeah, he'd be a good guest. I can't believe I've never mentioned him to you before. And so I, he was absolutely right. I think, yeah. you know, hearing just the steps that you've taken along the way, the journey that you've had going from a still photographer with a $200 setup to now working with a camera that's, you know, what, closer to 160, 170,000. That's quite a, quite yeah. a distance between those two things. I think just the effort that you've put into it along the way and just learning every step of the way, that says a lot to everybody that, you know, listens to our show and, and us, to be honest. Yeah. Well, that, I'd like to point out one difference. The $200 setup I owned. <laughs> Touche. You know, real quick, I gotta I get emails and questions all the time. I'm sure you guys do too. You know, what you know, do you think it's I'm on the right path? I'm gonna go to school and get a degree to be a photographer, whatever it is, and I wanna make a living doing this. And I'll tell you right now, this will be the podcast that I refer them to to go listen to to see if they're really interested in taking the leap. Because I think you've just touched on exactly what it really takes. And if they have that kind of get after it, then do it. But if not, you might really want to think hard about it. It's tough. It's tough. You know, and, yeah. and when anybody that works for themselves, and especially in a creative field, the hardest thing, and it's hard for me, believe me or not, I, and I speak and love to talk and, and I'm not shy, but the hardest thing to do, in, in my opinion, for me to do, is promote myself. That is the number one hardest thing to do. To go and sell myself is difficult. So if yeah. you can't do that, though, in some form, you're going to have a hard time. So, Steve, just for all of our listeners, where are the best places to find your content? You're on. Are you on Facebook? I'm on Facebook under Stephen Kirkpatrick and Kirkpatrick Wildlife. Website is kirkpatrickwildlife.com. Uh, the uh, Instagram is Kirkpatrick Wildlife, and Vimeo is either Stephen Kirkpatrick or Kirkpatrick Wildlife, or some variation thereof that I don't have to discover. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Just know that y'all can go to the show notes and and check that, and we'll have links to all this stuff, and we'll actually have the videos right on the show notes page. Well, appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your time, and and look forward to talking to you again. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way. We will be the biggest band in time.